bless you. <laughs> Again. <laughs> So the year is 1971 and everything's groovy. Uh, it's the Lawrence Welk Show and they have a wholesome duo by the band name Gale and Dale. No, I do not know who these people are. I just found this out by looking this up. So they came out on the show and performed a new song which had been released earlier that year by another band. They sang it with a folksy feel and winsome smiles. And when they concluded, the show host remarked, there you've heard a modern spiritual by Gale and Dale. The lyrics to the song begin, one toke over the line, sweet Jesus, one toke over the line. <laughs> she knows where this is headed. <laughs> now, believe it or not, I was not alive in the 1970s. So when I heard this song on the oldie station, my dad had to explain to me what a toke was. As it turns out, Gail and Dale, along with the producers of the TV show, also did not know that a toke is defined as a puff from a marijuana cigarette or pipe. So one toke over the line, sweet Jesus, one toke over the line does not mean what they think it means. <laughs> so uh, Mike Brewer of the band Brewer and Shipley, who wrote the song, is recorded as saying, one day we were pretty much stoned and all, and Tom says, man, I'm one toke over the line tonight. I like the way that sounded, and so I wrote a song around it. So because of the drug references, and I'd also assume the flippant use of Jesus's name, several radio stations actually refused to play the song. Mm -hmm. um, however, by simply misunderstanding one key word, a TV show and a band put their reputations mm -hmm. on the line because uh, they, uh, the song they didn't take time to listen to and discern its meaning. So what seemed like a sweet folksy spiritual is actually a song about going too far with drugs. As one of the band members who wrote the song explained, it's a song about excess. Too much of anything will probably kill you. So in the immortal words of Inigo Montoya of The Princess Bride, I do not think that means what you think it means. <laughs> But surely we don't make the same mistakes, and certainly not with the Bible, right? Right? <laughs> Perhaps you've played Bible roulette. So you're trying to discern a word of the Lord. You uh, take your Bible, you open it up, and you're like, okay, Lord, tell me something inspirational today, uh, something to encourage me. And you, you open up to something like Philippians, uh, let's see. Philippians 4.4, 4, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice, and that's great. Man, God, you got my back. Uh, suppose also you just open it up, and you're like, okay, here we go, and you get to Isaiah 41.24, and you read it as if God is speaking directly to you. Behold, you are nothing, and your work is less than nothing. An abomination is he who chooses you. What do you do next? Shake a die, two out of three. <laughs> no, uh, you start to question your methodology. Is this the way that God intends us to understand his word? Can we really just um, do something like this, dropping in out of context? And you guys are all adults, and you understand the silliness of this example, um, but there are people that actually treat the Bible this way. And so how can we help them uh, explain and understand what's going on? Uh, has God revealed himself this way? Does he mean for us to uh, parachute into the middle of his conversation, which he may not in fact be having with us directly, rip out what seems good to us and never pay attention to where he came from with these thoughts or to where he was headed with his words? Do we pay attention to what the author meant by his words, or do we make the same blunder as the singing duo, choosing a meaning convenient to them, irrespective of the original intent? 
To guard against such errors with God's words, students of Scripture have developed a system of interpretation under what is broadly called hermeneutics. So that kind of uh, comes to this new series we're doing over the next several weeks. The takeaway of the Gale and Dale tale, as I call it, good intentions don't make up for bad interpretation. The same goes for the Bible. So, uh, if you would, open your Bibles, and we're going to part in the book of John, go to chapter 17, and uh, we're going to be flying all over uh, the scripture this morning, but uh, this is a good home base for us. So, John 17, 17, would someone please read that verse? John 17, 17. Think the The Bible is a big book. It consists of 66 books from numerous authors of various backgrounds written over a time period greater than 1,000 years. When we study a part, how are we supposed to understand it in light of the whole? How do we fit into this grand narrative? That's what we are aiming to cover with this brief series, Understanding the Bible. A key element of our sanctification, as seen in John 17, 17, is the Word of God. Through this series, we want to take a little step back and observe what we are doing when we approach the Word of God. Are we doing it biblically? How does God expect us to use His Word? So it is the desire of Christ that His followers be sanctified in the truth of God's Word. If you've read uh, Psalm 119, it's the desire of the psalmist to treasure God's word in his heart that he might not sin against God. It is our desire to present in this series some core concepts of biblical interpretation so we can better understand the Bible for the purpose of our own personal endurance in the Christian walk and our own sanctification. Persistence in truth for the perseverance in faith. That's the subtitle. In this way, we are following the author of Hebrews, who exhorts us to exhort one another. So Hebrews 3, 12 to 14. Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart, leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. So sin can deceive us and can affect the way that we interpret the Bible. In fact, not challenging ourselves to grow in our interpretational method is a, a kind of pride. Rather, we want to be like Timothy. Uh, we want to be like Timothy, who was commissioned by Paul to exercise intentional effort to use the Bible in a proper way. Would someone please read this? Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. Obviously, this is Paul talking to Timothy, who's a pastor out in Ephesus, but uh, this is something that we can all aspire to be as approved workers, properly handling the word of truth. So the first step of what we'll cover today in this series is uh, a quick overview of foundational methodology, um, hermeneutics. So hermeneutics has nothing to do with a guy named Herman, in case you're wondering. Um, it's the science and art of biblical interpretation. So how are we to approach interpreting the Bible? Is there actually a need for intentional methodology? After that, we've engaged in the big picture themes of scripture, such as these other topics the gentlemen will uh, cover later weeks, that inform us not just how we interpret the Bible and its various parts, but how we understand we are, where we are today. For instance, there's a difference between Israel and the monarchy and us as Christians but how do we articulate that? We call Christ our king, but did that, what did that mean for the Jews in first century Israel? And what does that mean for us today who do not see him physically sitting on the throne? Furthermore, there are numerous prophecies that aren't fulfilled. How are we to understand those according to the direction of God in history? Do we spiritualize them and say that they're all fulfilled in Jesus? Or do we have an expectation that God is going to operate according to the way that he has presented his word? So the topics of the next few weeks may look a little strange and uh, academic and may be hard to understand if you're from Texas, but, um, 
we'll be covering concepts that are often thrown around in theological circles or discussed at the seminary level. The point is not to make you or us look smart or to be divisive with our choices of interpretational systems, but to share some helpful insights and engage our thinking for how we uh, understand the Bible as a whole and to begin to equip us in our daily interactions with God's word. So this is more than just an exercise in interpretive methodology. This is a challenge to look attentively at scripture in a way that honors God for the trajectory of history that he has taken. So today, uh, it's my privilege to talk about hermeneutics. Uh, when I took my hermeneutics class during the one-year program, uh, it was rough. But one of the things that we had to memorize was, as Dr. Sigler put it, word for blessed word, uh, this uh, definition, the science and the art of biblical interpretation. In both the science and an art, there's a feel for it, but there is also a concrete methodology. There's, uh, there's a way that you can understand literature, and we do that today. Um, people with English degrees or uh, literature studies often do the same thing. This, the Bible is a book. So uh, why is it important to engage in hermeneutics in the first place? So first, we all interpret the Bible somehow, but do we actually think about what we're doing when we do so? By looking at the way that you and I approach scripture, we can find out if we're doing it the way God expects us to. So there's a lot at stake. Uh, this last week, the church had their uh, ethics conference. The way Christians develop their ethics is through scripture. Your understanding of scripture depends on your hermeneutics. Hermeneutics is the science and art of biblical interpretation. You counsel others based on the Bible. Your understanding of the Bible depends on your hermeneutics. You teach your children and encourage your spouse through the Bible. Your understanding of the Bible depends on your hermeneutics. Here's a big one. You fight temptation like Jesus with God's word. Your understanding of God's word and the applicability of passages to your real life situation comes from your hermeneutics. This is a big deal. And bad hermeneutics, if you ever want to explore it, happens in that temptation account. They're both pulling scripture. At a certain point, Satan's like, I can play that too, and tries to pull one on Jesus. So it's more than I can get into, but it's interesting to say that, yes, um, brief passages of scripture are helpful for us when it comes to things like counseling others or interpretation, but let's make sure we understand what it's actually saying and where it comes from and how applicable it is to us today, which is hermeneutics. So as a class, we're going to take some time to step back and look at these foundational concepts so that we can better understand the Bible and thereby live, counsel, teach, and fight temptation biblically. Understanding truth for the persistence or for the purpose of persistence in truth and perseverance in faith. So the three core concepts we'll cover today within the field of hermeneutics are authorial intent, progress of revelation, and meaning versus application. So uh, real brief aside, um, as much as it would be helpful to actually look at a passage and go through all these steps. We don't really have time to do that this morning. And a lot of you do have experience reading English and you have wonderful English translations. So what I wanna do is spur you on with these concepts that uh, underline and inform what you are already doing as you read your Bible. So we're gonna start with authorial intent. I would say, that authorial intent is uh, the target of hermeneutics for the purpose of true application. So when you come to a passage of scripture, you are trying to determine the meaning. Meaning lies with the author. So whenever you approach a passage of scripture, there are three parties involved. There is the reader, there is the text, and there is the author. Uh, a God-honoring way of approaching hermeneutics is understanding the priority of author over both text and reader. There, I won't get into it, uh, but there are other 
contesting theories about how to uh, uh, understand text. You can approach it from a, a feminist uh, hermeneutic or uh, other sorts of uh, gay, transgender, um, you know, good old country boy hermeneutic. You know, you, your name, you can name it. But the point is, you approach the text in order to understand what the author is telling you. The author wrote the text in order to communicate something to you, the reader. It flows author, text, reader. And so we can uh, see the fail of Gale and Dale now. It doesn't matter what you think the text means. In the final analysis, the author, in their case, the songwriters, had the authority to say what the meaning was. So we have a book. It's called the Bible. And uh, we got to ask the question uh, first, who is the author? Before we get to that, <laughs> before we get to that, uh, we want to find out what the author of our book has to say about the book as a whole. Uh, first, hopefully you didn't actually see us. <laughs> <laughs> you guys are parents, uh, counselors, friends, um, neighbors. What are some passages that you would go to when it comes to pointing out the authorship of scripture? This is an open question. Psalm 19. And can you develop that a little bit? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Uh, Psalm 19, it, or the longer version, much longer version, Psalm 119. Um, just have a lot to say about, um, about Scripture, what it's like, what it can do, what it's for. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess I'll turn there and read a little bit of it. Um, and sort of like what the character of it is. So, well. <clears throat> so some of the some of the passage that I think is uh, relevant to your question is the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. Verse seven. Uh, the testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. Um, there's much, much more there, um, but it's um, perfect and inerrant, and it is from the Lord. And this would be, if you think um, David or whoever the psalmist was wrote this, this would be all of the scripture written up, up to that point. Mm -hmm. um, but that is how, um, that is how the psalmist understood all the revelation up to that point. Absolutely. The Bible has uh, numerous claims for itself as to its divine origin. Are there any other passages that come to mind? I mean, just all over the prophets where it constantly says, thus saith the Lord, mm -hmm. and then 10 chapters or whatever, you know. Yeah. Absolutely. It's just the record, actual recorded words of the Lord. Yeah. Absolutely. Anybody else? Second Peter 1 21. What comes to mind from that, just oh. in, in a nutshell? Uh, that the Holy Spirit inspired the authors of the text to to uh, write what they wrote. Absolutely. So, uh, basically what I just asked you is a systematic theology question. So if you don't own a good systematic theology book, it's helpful because they'll compile a lot of these texts to help answer these questions. What does the whole Bible have to say about a specific topic? Particularly the authorship of Scripture, or the inerrancy of Scripture, or the authority the uh, clarity, the necessity. So one of the uh, primary passages that will come up on the authorship of scripture across the board is this one. So all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the man of God, the anthropos, um, can be thoroughly equipped, furnished for every good work. So scripture, all scripture, is sourced by God. Ultimately, the grounds for the profitableness and applicableness of scripture is its divine origin. And uh, like Steve mentioned, Peter also affirms the divine uh, origin of scripture and sheds some light on the two author nature of any inspired passages. Knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So we have this idea of inspiration. God uses uh, 
real people with real backgrounds, uh, personalities. Uh, they had their own parents and the way they were raised, preferences, experiences, etc. But it's also superintended by the Holy Spirit. And again, the whole point of this is we're find, figuring out who the author is in the grand scheme of things so that when we approach it hermeneutically, we're asking, what did that author intend? So the unique factor when it comes to approaching this literature as opposed to you know, Jane Austen is we got God involved and we have what? Not just Peter, but we have passages as Paul. We have passages that's um, Luke or Job or others. So it's a little bit more complicated. So that's why it's important to establish what are we talking about when we talk about author in scripture. So uh, there's a harmony between the capital A author and the lowercase a author. So um, how do we go about um, approaching the text? So we're wanting to discern authorial intent. Um, how do we go about discovering the original meaning of a text as intended by the author? There are several practical considerations which we'll cover briefly, but I want to start with our attitude. We've already recognized that this is God's word. We know there is opportunity for messing it up. We also believe that the author of the book we're reading is alive <laughs> and well listening to us right now and is approachable by prayer and his spirit lives within us so let's first have a heart attitude that's willing to ask for help so in Psalm 119 18 open my eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of your law this is a passage that an elder back in my church often prays uh, and I think prays with his family when they approach scripture uh, the psalmist asks for help for insight into God's teaching. So here's a question for you. You and I may ask for help in reading the Bible, but do we anticipate that prayer being answered and seeing wondrous things? Do we come to the text not just anticipating greater knowledge, but hungering for greater wonder? Have we lost the hunger for the extraordinary? We live in a digital age. Uh, VR is going to be coming uh, more and more part of our lives. The imagination of man is uh, so manifold and amazing, uh, creating beautiful worlds that don't exist, but God created our imagination. And by his thoughts, this whole world exists. So anyway, what is your attitude when approaching the text, and what is your expectation when you approach the Bible? Do you not just want to understand what it says, but do you want to be amazed by it? A couple of other verses. Teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. Again, as uh, mentioned already, Psalm 119 is a great psalm for uh, anything to do with your relationship to Scripture. Verse 34, give me understanding that I may keep your law and observe it with my whole heart. Here we see a different purpose for the request, wholehearted obedience. Knowing as we do that we, though we are redeemed, we still struggle with the flesh, do we take the time to acknowledge that reality before God and ask his help not just to know his word, but to do it? To not just do it, but to do it wholeheartedly. Scripturally speaking, the heart is the mind, will, and emotions, the full gamut of your operational control center. This kind of obedience needs help. We often have to challenge our assumptions of the text, so we want to approach it with humility and see it with a teachable attitude. So, having established then our attitude in approaching scripture, which is we want to request insight, uh, we anticipate wonder, and we ask for help for obedience. Practically speaking, there are some things to observe in a text in order to ascertain meaning. So within the text, you can look for key words, uh, repetition of words or concepts, place names, 
lists, contrasts, figures of speech, etc. Again, I wrote my email up here for a reason. Please don't try to write all this down. <laughs> if you want my notes, just email me. I'll give them to you. I actually wrote this whole thing out, so it's basically going to sound like what I'm just reading to you. But uh, again, uh, figures of speech, etc. We want to ask the question: Who's speaking? Who is the audience? What is the tone of the passage? What genre is the text? How does the author use that genre to convey meaning? So, for instance, remember we're parked where? John, you got your Bibles open, right? 17, 17. John seventeen seventeen. Uh, can somebody uh, tell me who is speaking? Jesus. I'll give you a hint. Yes, it's Jesus, but you're not going to figure that out by only reading John 17, 17. There's a greater context where this sits. So yes, Jesus. This is often called the high priestly prayer. Uh, to whom is Jesus speaking? Absolutely. Before whom is he speaking? Who's there and present to hear this? Disciples in the upper room. Of whom is he speaking? Specifically his disciples in this section, right? Absolutely. Can somebody read uh, verses 20 to 21? I do not ask on behalf of these alone, but for those also who believe in me through your word that they may all be one. Even to you, Father, are in me, and I am in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you sent me. Absolutely. So yes, he is speaking of the disciples. But later on in the passage, if, you, if we have missed the greater context of verses uh, 20 and following, Jesus expands the prayer to include you sanctify them in the truth your word is truth this is the will of jesus asking the father for those of us who have believed him based on the testimony of the witness of the disciples tracing back through the meal understanding the context of scripture allows it to hit home a little bit different <laughs> so uh, one of the things I want to say uh, briefly is again I can't go into the whole uh, hermeneutical method when it comes to analyzing a text but I can point you to some resources so uh, many of these observational tricks from the previous slide are what you would generally employ in looking at any literature for, for instance uh, you may have learned some of them in prepping for the reading portions of standardized tests. Uh, it's just the way language works. Um, but one thing I would recommend uh, is, if you want to go further, uh, Duval and Hayes have a book called Grasping God's Word. It's a very approachable book for hermeneutics. If you and your family want to go through it, I believe uh, it's used on both the college and seminary level, but it's very understandable. They have this uh, thing they call the interpretive journey that kind of visualizes what you're trying to do when you come to a text. First step uh, with the number one, and yes, I stole this off the internet, but you're not paying me, so I think that it's <laughs> fair to um, Grasp the text in their town. You ask, what did the text mean to the original audience? Step two, measure the width of the river to cross. You can see inside the river, it says culture, language, time, situation. There are a lot of things that separate us from that original context. What are the differences between the biblical audience and us? Step number three is pretty crucial. Cross the principalizing bridge. If you try to type principalizing, it will uh, run in error. <laughs> uh, what is the theological principle in the text? You're looking for timeless truth that transcends their situation to us. And often that's actually tied to the character of God because what? God doesn't change. change. It's beautiful. 
Consult the biblical map. Where, how does our theological principle fit with the rest of the Bible? This is kind of a, a check and balance against you. Did I just come to a conclusion that elsewhere they're saying uh, that's not what you should conclude? Uh, grasp the text in our town, step five. So we've gone from the biblical city to the modern city. Uh, how should individual Christians today live out the theological principles? So again, Duvall and Hayes grasping God's word, um, all the credit to them for this cartoon. But uh, when it comes to the practical way to study the text, there are different resources and helps that are out there. So one thing I would recommend though, when it comes to the Bible, um, is this additional question, um, actually something that you mentioned earlier with Psalm 19, uh, what does the author know? As in, what information is available to this author at this point in time? So this is not to psychoanalyze him to find out, okay, this guy was a middle child. Um, <laughs> he was never spanked. Um, and he was vegan. Uh, no, it's, not, it's also not to deny that God often revealed new things to his prophets. But we do accept the reality that there is big, capital letter A, author, and lowercase a, author. There are two parties involved working in unison. So what did the man know of God's word to that point? This leads us to the next point we'll cover today, the concept of progressive revelation. What does the author know? So I believe in this concept of progressive revelation. Again, it's kind of a no-duh. God revealed things over time. Uh, when you study a passage, consider when it was delivered. What corpus of scripture was available? Uh, these can provide some really interesting insights. Uh, again, as you know, God revealed himself over time. God, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the deep. It's not till chapter 6 that uh, man is created. Man did not witness that. God conveyed that knowledge to him of what he did in a way that was important for him to keep. Knowledge of the creation and then the flood account um, is condensed into one family. They keep this knowledge and it's passed down either orally or in different written forms until it's compiled by Moses. Moses, when he's writing Exodus, uh, Numbers, Deuteronomy, has written Genesis. So, when you read those, keep that in mind. He is very much aware of Genesis because he wrote it. When you get to Joshua, Joshua lived with Moses and uh, worked with him. He's very much familiar with Genesis through Deuteronomy. You get to the prophets. Uh, one of the most interesting things is to realize, again, uh, one of the reasons why Justin uh, so much loves Deuteronomy, other than its devotional nature, those of you that know Justin Holloway. Uh, it's quoted all over the place. It is a presumed knowledge when you read the Old Testament prophets. You can't really understand Jeremiah so great unless you understand Deuteronomy. And when you come to Lamentations, you start to realize these people are experiencing the tragedies that God has just forewarned them of centuries before in detail. But also, the prophets hearken back to the character of God. Again, crossing the principalizing bridge, something that stands uh, the test of time, God's character. Something I would encourage you to consider, this is just like a homework assignment, if you will. Exodus 34, 6 to 8. It's quoted extensively in the Old Testament. It's when Moses passes, uh, when Moses is with God, and the Lord passes before Moses and proclaims his name. And the Lord says, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, abounding in steadfast love, forgiving iniquities, transgressions, and sin, and uh, etc. That passage will be quoted throughout the Old Testament as a testimony of God's character. I'm going to cling to this reality. You have brothers and sisters in the faith that you read about who held tightly to the revealed word of God that they had it's a uh, I don't know it's, it's just encouraging to think of it that way they too had to hold on to God's word 
and cling to his promises, especially when they started to see the fulfillment of some of the things that their forefathers had done. So interestingly, some Old Testament prophets actually show uh, proof of knowing yeah, uh, what other Old Testament prophets had written. So in this passage in Jeremiah, I'm not going to read it to you, but the people remember a prior prophet's words, a prophet by the name of Micah. We have a book called Micah in the Bible. <laughs> And they quote Micah 3.12. Another one that's pretty cool, Daniel 9, 1 through 2. In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, by descent to me, who was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, perceived in the books the number of years that, according to the word of the Lord to Jeremiah the prophet, must pass before the end of the desolations of Jerusalem, namely 70 years. Uh, how did Daniel get to Babylon? He was exiled before the destruction of Jerusalem. Who was preaching the destruction of Jerusalem? Among other people, Jeremiah, who witnessed the destruction of Jerusalem and then got uh, whisked away to Egypt against his will. Jeremiah. In all likelihood, Daniel was in the same city when Jeremiah was there. And he's reading this uh, account of what Jeremiah said, and he's already determining that this is the word of God, and he's holding to it uh, as if it is. So anyway, it's, it's too much to get into how the canon of Scripture is formed, but this is one beautiful testament to the fact that uh, when the word of the Lord was delivered, it was received as such. Um, so anyway, could the reality of progressive revelation, knowing what the author knows, uh, interpret how we understand the author's words, knowing that he may be drawing on ideas already developed by someone else? Definitely. My point is to not dive deep into these topics, to share, but to share with you some considerations that have helped my observation of scripture. These are ways to enrich your thought process and time as you read these passages. Um, this is a concept called intertextuality. Um, it's one thing to revel in the fact that uh, J.K. Rowling wrote the Harry Potter series with cohesiveness so that the first book is referenced in the last book. This reality of God's word is our universe. And it makes sense to understand these passages do not exist in vacuum. Again, we don't parachute into the text and try to steal it and say, uh, this is mine, forget what it comes from. Uh, and also we want to approach these authors and understand that they too had a Bible on their laps. It just looked a little bit different. What was that Bible? So finally, uh, with minutes to spare, <laughs> uh, you guys are going to actually just bear with me, so <laughs> we got seven more slides, so we'll be fast. What does the author know of God's written word to this point? Is he drawing on ideas already developed elsewhere? How should that knowledge affect my interpretation? Is he assuming his audience knows where he's coming from? That's one of the frustrating things about the minor prophets is they assume a lot on you. Uh, how can I get up to speed with his audience? And that's where you can get into... Uh, some helpful commentaries or at the minimum that first page that introduces your study bible it's pretty helpful so we cover the concept of authorial intent we say hermeneutics is a science and art of biblical interpretation and it is on a quest for meaning and the aim should be for the original meaning as intended by the author the bible is a complex book of multiple authors over many years and uh, they have a unifying author the holy spirit writing through them Regarding progressive revelation, we've noted that God reveals himself progressively over time. One of the things that's helpful to ask then is what does this particular human author know? This helps us in those two ways. We can also pay attention to how our brothers and sisters in the faith use scripture. What was their hermeneutical method? Did they take God literally when God said, destruction is coming if you disobey? Turns out they did. Um, so 
Once you and I discover the meaning of the text, it's important not to forget the final part. Application. There will be a single meaning to a passage, but there can be multiple applications. One of the key parts of the interpretive journey is the principalizing bridge that we talked about. Uh, appealing to God's uh, character is one of the helpful ways to cross that divide. Um, you determine what is the timeless truth that was intended for the original audience that also applies to me. And in light of that truth, <coughs> ask, how should this impact my life? So some of the passages of scripture that speak to this, whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, that through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. Second Timothy as well applies here. We use that verse to um, affirm God's uh, authorship, but it also says all scripture is not just God breathed, but is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that you and I can be equipped, thoroughly furnished for the work God has for us. Um, this is just a real quick uh, helpful thing. I'm in a class with Dr. Andy Burgraff, and he mentioned that his pastor uncle uh, has this helpful acronym for new believers when they approach the text. Put on your specs when you read the Bible. You ask yourself, what are some sins to avoid? What are some promises to keep? What are examples to follow? And are there any commands to obey? So it is my pleasure this morning, just in time, to introduce you to my co-teacher, Pastor Dave. <laughs> He's not about to walk through that door, but you're about to walk out that door. And so uh, here's what I think is helpful. You may not have time this week to review what we covered uh, or look further into hermeneutics. And honestly, life is busy. God has called all of you to different things. But by the sovereign grace of God, you sit under godly teaching every day of faithful expositors who pull out the truth, and you can do this multiple times a week with different pastors. So when a person teaches, they're also teaching us how to study. So when you go out to the sermon this morning, try paying attention to how Pastor Davey engages in biblical interpretation. Learn from the sermon. What does he say is the meaning of the passage versus the application? Again, there's a difference. We want to first discern the meaning so that we can appropriately and in a God-honoring way develop an application for our lives. He may use not use those terms. Often he uses the term principle, but he will distinguish the two. Also, how does progressive revelation apply to the Gospel of Luke? At the very small level, what did the audience of Jesus in the passage we're about to go study, uh, what did that audience just hear him say? before this passage that we're studying this morning. There's a context to it. What about the passage does Pastor Davey point out to help clarify the original meaning as intended by the author and or the speaker of the passage? Again, you have an opportunity when being taught to not just receive knowledge, but to learn how to study. So use it as a great resource. Uh, conclusion, finally. <laughs> Look at this. God is good. Uh, the goal of hermeneutics is to understand the original meaning for the purpose of application. So we have authorial intent is our target. It's not about reading my meaning into the text. The first question is not, what does this mean to me? But what does this mean? After interpreting meaning, we can move to application. Additionally, each human author, like you, exists at a hit point in history in the progress of Revelation. What insights does that bring to your study? I don't know about you, but it is cool to think about the people of God at various stages of history being dependent on the Word of God. We are not alone. There were many people who lived in periods like we do where we don't see God parting seas or slaying giants. They, too, had to hold fast to the word of God, which they had. Think about the faithful who heard the preaching of Jeremiah, who 
knowing that the city was about to fall, that their infants would be dashed against the rocks, their wives would be raped, all these things. There are believers throughout history they're clinging to the promises of God that this is not how things are supposed to go. There is a king coming. They would experience God's blessings. Though not right now. How cool is it that we have the full revelation of God in that? There is a difference then between meaning and application. Don't bypass the meaning to shortcut to your ideas of application. But also, don't only focus on meaning and forget to apply the text. I would encourage you, because I have a small measure of authority by standing in front of you, <laughs> uh, a memory verse, it's so easy, is John 17, 17. Sanctify them in the truth, your word is true. When you think of that verse, bring in the context. Jesus is talking to the Father on my behalf. personal reflection. What is your responsibility towards others in hermeneutics? Knowledge of truth is not license for unkindness, but a privilege for service. I would recommend uh, as takeaway that you read and reflect on these two passages. First one, Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. The second one, Priscilla and Aquila with Apollos. How do they handle a greater knowledge of the truth and helping somebody else understand? And what can you thank God for right now regarding biblical interpretation? Do you need a prompt? Read Psalm 119, 9 to 16, and Romans 15 to 4. Finally, and I really do mean this, let's see if I can find Hebrews because Jesus is cool. And I think it is worthwhile to close this out thinking about what it means that we live in a dispensation where Jesus has already come. Long ago, in a galaxy far, no, long ago, <laughs> at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. Glory be to God. Let's pray. Lord, teach me your way, O oh Lord, the way of your statutes, and I will keep it to the end. Give me understanding that I may keep your law and observe it with my whole heart. Lead me in the path of your commandments, for I delight in them. Incline my heart to your testimonies and not to selfish gain. Turn my eyes from looking at worthless things, and give me life in your way. Confirm to your servant your promise that you may be feared. Turn away the reproach that I dread, for your rules are good. Behold, I long for your precepts and your righteousness to give me life. And Lord, we praise you and thank you for Jesus. And we ask for help to treat your word in a way that honors you and is edifying to us. In Jesus' name. Thank <laughs> you.